Hey, I'm Dan Altman. I'm the chief economist at Instawork, a leading online marketplace for connecting local businesses or across the US and Canada with our network of 4 million hourly in-person workers. And I'm here today with Kevin Lawton from the New Warehouse podcast. And we're going to talk a little bit about the use of flexible work in the warehouse setting and other light industrial roles. I'm really excited to get the chance to talk with Kevin again. He is a fantastic resource in this subject area. I'm going to let him introduce himself as well right now. Kevin, good morning. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me and, and good to, to talk with you again. I am Kevin, as you mentioned, right? I, I think that's pretty clear at this point. Founder and host uh, of The New Warehouse, which is a, a podcast focused on all things warehousing. And we like to say that we, we try to make warehouses sexy, definitely. And uh, we also have a micro fulfillment center as well in, in Philadelphia, where we are leveraging some flexible work, which we're going to be talking about today as well. And I think we want to kind of start from a situation on the, on the ground, I think, right? From my perspective, as someone that's worked in warehousing, has a, a current fulfillment center as well. But I think the the regarding labor and, and what's going on in the, in the market, and it has been going on in the market for, for a couple of years now, has certainly been a challenging aspect for the, the warehousing space, manufacturing space, and, and a lot of spaces in general. I think, too, if we just go out there, even as from a consumer perspective, I think we see some of the impact just in retail locations, restaurant locations that we see. Um, but especially from that, that warehousing perspective, as we look at the pandemic and the, the impact it's had, I think, you know, a lot of workers have looked for other options maybe that were safer at the time and have discovered new avenues of work and, and new ways to work. And, and traditionally, the warehousing space has been pretty rigid, uh, I would say, in, in those working and environments in terms of uh, when we talk about flexibility and and being able to, as a, as a warehouse worker, being able to, to have some flexibility in the schedule has been a, a little difficult, I think. And, and the warehouse kind of culture, I, I guess, and then work environment, that, that kind of old school mentality of, you know, this is the this is the shift and, and this is the shift no matter what. And uh, yeah, we need you to come in on Saturday too, right? And, and you know, we're we're asking, but we're also kind of telling in a sense, in a way. So, you know, I, I think there's been some some resistance on that from, from the workforce in the past couple of years. And that's created a, a challenge where it's been difficult to, to bring people in uh, to the warehousing space and, and hire uh, and really kind of increase that labor um, and bring that labor pool up. Um, and also, I think two people are are realizing, you know, we don't necessarily want to do this type of of work, and we don't want to do these repetitive kind of the, I think what a lot of people will say is the dull, dirty, sometimes dangerous type of task within the the warehousing field, and and you know they're looking for something something more, something more fulfilling, I guess, than working in a fulfillment center. There, a little. On, I guess, <laughs> sense came out there. But yeah, I mean, I think there's that. And then I think from the, the employer perspective too, on the, on the ground, you know, certainly something that the challenge is, is getting labor in, but is also the, the challenge on the, the cost perspective too. And some of the things that have happened since the pandemic is just labor cost and, and wages just to get, just to get those people in the door and attracted to a potential spot within your warehouse is the wages have just kind of skyrocketed in a sense. I mean, even from from my perspective, I opened a building for a company within 18, I believe it was. And, and we started out what, at the time, which was a, an incredible wage we thought in the in the area and was very competitive. And and just within, you know, two years or so, we saw that wage like go way up and, and it created this this imbalance within the workforce too and, and all these different things. So it's a it's a really kind of challenging market navigating and, and trying to create that environment where, where people want to want to come in and work and then not only get them in the door, but then also retain them as well. So it's it's certainly something that kind of opens up the door for some of them different options and, and looking at different perspectives in terms of utilizing flexible work or, or things of that nature. Yeah, for sure. You know, it feels like there are kind of a couple different segments of the labor force now that are interacting in this space. Early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, it was clear you had to pay people more to get them to show up and do warehouse work or any kind of in-person work just because they were taking more risks to do it. You know, it was absolutely and more. Yeah. And so it was kind of natural that wages would start to go up 
some people left the labor force and, and other people, as you said, moved into other occupations. And that really put a squeeze on the labor supply for this kind of work. And, and again, that would push wages up as well. But now, you know, we're seeing with rising prices, and rising interest rates in this economy, there are a lot of people who want to do extra work. Maybe it's just a couple of shifts a month just to make ends meet. And when we survey the workers on our platform who are doing in-person flexible work, about three quarters of them say that they're doing this kind of work to pay for essentials. And so it's not just to save for a rainy day or something like that. They, they really need this money to make ends meet. And so that's bringing a lot of new people into this space where potentially at an entry level, they can come in and, and learn some new skills and make the extra money they need. And in fact, there's been so much interest in this kind of work that in our platform, the hourly pay rates really haven't moved that much. You know, yes. it's, 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 it's something to see, especially at the entry level, that we've only seen maybe one or two percentage point increases in, in those hourly pay rates. Now, when you go up to the more intermediate level jobs that require a bit more skill, a bit more experience, maybe running equipment, dealing with computers and automation, stuff like that, those, those hourly pay rates have continued to rise a fair amount. Those hourly pay rates have continued to rise a fair amount, but it's, it's, it's been really interesting to see that there's been such an interest in this kind of work, so much labor supply that we're just not seeing the, the hourly pay rates rise that much. Now, the other thing I would say about this is the flexibility is key. As you pointed out, not everybody wants to keep working those same hours, same shift. And we find when we survey workers and businesses that after pay, which obviously is very important to most people, the next most important thing is that flexibility. And we still see more than half of businesses in this area offering flexibility as a benefit and a way to attract and retain workers. Our state of warehouse labor report, which came out this year, confirms that and finds that more and more of these businesses are using flexible workers. We see now amongst two thirds or more of businesses in the sector they're using flexible labor, they're getting used to it, and it's working for both sides. It's, it's working for the workers and, and it's working for the businesses as well. Now, now we find about four sort of key benefits to using flexible labor in the sector right now. And I'll just go over these before I throw it back to you, Kevin. Um, sure. Number one is you're reducing the risk of downtime. You know, If you're just relying on permanent employees, then if somebody can't make a shift one day, you're not just going to hire another person to make that one shift. But if you have flexible workers, then if one person doesn't pick up a shift, chances are somebody else will. Second is recruitment. There are, as you said, Kevin, some people don't want that full-time job in this sector. You know, They, they don't right. want to work five, six days a week, same shift every day, or even worse, have somebody else choose when they're supposed to work. And so if you want to access all of the talent pool, you can't just offer one type of job. You have to offer mm -hmm. flexibility as well to get some of those other people whose skills you might need. Another benefit is agility. You know, it's very important to be able to respond to demand. And, and companies all through the supply chain know this. We talk about just-in-time supply chains and being able to, to bring materials and inputs in on a short notice basis. Uh, but, but we could do it with labor now too. And uh, especially in an economic cycle like this where we're not sure when demand's really going to come back, uh, we see some new orders starting to come in now, but we're not sure exactly when and where the supply chains are really going to get going again. Uh, it helps to be able to hire quickly to bring people in on very short notice basis. And with flexible work, a lot of our warehouse shifts are filling on average in just a few hours. Uh, and, and so there's, there's basically no more just-in-time source of labor than that. So those are some of the really important benefits. And uh, I, I think that if, if we look a little bit further at it, we'll find over time that, that companies are adopting flexible work so that they can just balance their portfolio of labor, you know, and that now they can have many different kinds of labor and use them in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a really great point there. And I, I think, you know, I, I've always thought in a sense that the, you know, your warehouse worker, if you look at a, a company that's, that's selling a product that needs to deliver a product to a customer, I mean, ultimately your, your warehouse worker is that and a last line of defense before before touches or the last person that's going to touch that product before it gets to your customer, right? That's your your last chance to make sure it's it's right, right? Make sure that customer experience is going to be okay, and that's increasingly more important, especially as we expand on e-commerce and, and fulfillment too. As you know, that really becomes your your touch point with the customer when the customer received that product. So you want it to be right, you want it to be correct, you know, no damages, you want it to be on time, all those things. So. 
you know, giving what's been traditionally that, that rigid structure that I talked about previously for the warehouse worker. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's like about time that we're able to give that flexibility to the warehouse worker. I think to, you know, my experience during the pandemic as a, as a warehouse manager, you know, we were deemed essential, of course, working in the warehouse and, you know, there was no flexibility there. You know, I had friends from, from college and things that are working in different types of jobs and they're like, oh, what are you guys doing while you're working out? Right. And I'm like, you know, this is a, this is a normal day for <laughs> me, basically, you know, it's just a lot more rules and regulations about, you know, taking temperatures and wearing masks and, and things like that and testing. But, you know, those, those warehouse workers, you know, they kept going and they're, and they're still in there doing the work while, you know, people in the office get the flexibility and, and things like that. So I think it's time that, you know, we were able to, to give that opportunity to them. And it is great that there's platforms now like in store work that are allowing for that to happen. And I think it's interesting too, you know, because I, I utilize some flexible workers my, myself and, you know, I, when I speak to them and I talk to them and even I've talked to some just gig workers in general just to kind of get their, their feeling like, you know, how do they feel about these situations? And, you know, even kind of the perspective of like, you know, oh, is this all you do or is this something you do on the side? And, and like you said, Daniel, you know, some of the data shows and it, it's many, many of them are doing this stuff on the side, but even I, I've talked to some who interestingly, I remember this, this kid, I say kid, but he was probably like early twenties, which I, that's, I think it, no. uh, it's a shame to say no. that that's a kid to me now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, I spoke to him and, and he was doing Uber Eats and, and we utilized Uber for package delivery in some sense. And, and I just said, you know, like, like, how does this work out for you and stuff? And, and he's just, you know, he really understood like the flexibility of being able to leverage these different types of, of gig platforms. And he's like, I have a, a set number for the day that my, my goal, and I know like, you know, I come out, maybe I work uh, three, four hours, maybe less. And I, I hit that, you know, that dollar goal for the day and, and I'm good. And then I go do whatever yeah. I want to do for the rest of the day. And, you know, I think that's more, it's more like, you know, you're giving this empowerment to the, the worker to have that flexibility. And, and when things happen too, you know, we oftentimes had, you know, people within the warehouse and you know, they're either, they, they immigrated to the country and, you know, something happens back home, wherever they're from, and, you know, they have to go back home and, and handle something. And, you know, it's a, it, it's a tough situation because you don't have that flexibility when it comes to PTO and, and things like that, but it's hard to handle that situation. So I think, you know, being a flexible worker gives you that kind of flexibility if you know you have sure. other things going on and, you know, whether you can only work like certain shifts a week, because you don't see a lot of places where it's like, Hey, we have a, a two day shift, right? Like that's not like a normal thing. Right. So being able to have that flexibility for a worker, I think is a, is a great thing, certainly. And then from the, the employer perspective too, from the warehouse perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense because, you know, especially as we see the kind of demand ebb and flow throughout the year, we have these different peak seasons and, you know, we have a, a core staff of, you know, full-time employees, but oftentimes, and I've certainly been in these conversations and in meetings as a warehouse manager where, you know, it's like, we're going into our slow season and, you know, well, you know, the budget is going to be reduced. So, you know, we have to figure out like, who are we going to cut? And oftentimes it's a very, it's very difficult decision because you have, you know, you get a, a solid team through that peak season and, you know, you have a lot of high performers and, and things like that. And, you know, it's, it, it's a difficult decision, like who we're going to cut and you don't want to cut anybody. I mean, you never want to like cut a job for somebody, but it's, it's the reality of, of business and, and being able to leverage from an employer perspective that the flexible worker at that peak season time versus, you know, bringing on a bunch of full-time employees that later you're going to have to, to lose. And then, you know, the next year you're wishing you, you still had them, right? It's this cycle that kind of we can, we can break a little bit by using the flexible workforce. And I think it makes a lot of sense, especially too, as you see, you know, these occurrences where, you know, we certainly have like people that we're, we're holding on to, even though there's like not enough work for them, right? Because we don't want to lose that talent. But as you start to use the flexible workers and you have these ones that you're, you've trained up and you can bring them in and out without having to like, severed ties that you kind of would in the, you know, normal full-time employee spectrum that, that gives you a lot more kind of comfort, I think, as an employer, as a warehouse manager too, that like, 
hey, like, I, I don't have to cut this person. And then, you know, like two weeks from now, it picks back up. And all of a sudden, I'm scrambling now to find somebody new and train them up and, and all these different things, which I, I think is, is really a great thing. Definitely. Yep. You know, we, we advise our business partners to, you know, maintain their core permanent employees who are experienced, who have that institutional memory, who can train people as they come on, and then have also a group every month of flexible workers to cut that downtime, to reduce that risk so that you always have someone to come in. And then you have the margin, right, where you might be bringing in extra people for peak periods, uh, and, or you might not bring anybody in in a slower period. That allows you to respond to demand. And you know, along that spectrum, you really have a variety of different options for how much of a commitment you want to make to the work. One of the benefits of uh, using flexible work is you can sort of try before you buy. You can try people out on a training shift or a regular shift and see if that really works. It's not like the old days where either you hire someone, when they show up on Monday and they're your employee now yeah. and you made a commitment <laughs> to them before you even let them work in your workplace or zero, you know, nothing. Now you have this option in between where you can try before you buy, you know, start with the training shifts, a regular shift. Then you can add workers to your roster. So you'll be dispatching ship exclusively to them. Those are the ones that you decided that you do like, that you're happy to have come to your workplace. And then if you want to make a bigger commitment to somebody and have them make that commitment to you, you can do a long-term assignment or even a permanent hire. And, and we have quite a few situations where our pros, our professionals on the platform get that permanent hire after they've worked for a while at the workplace. The other thing that they can do is, is they can gain skills. And we see people moving up the ladder, you know, going from that entry level or general labor position up to a more skilled warehouse position where they're capable of dealing with commitment or supervising other workers. And, and, and that's great for them because they pick up skills. They have options in the labor market. They're, they're earning usually a higher hourly rate at that point. But it's also great for the employer because you have sort of these two axes where you can calibrate those relationships sort of how strong you want that commitment to be and also, you know, how much you want to get them into more advanced roles. So there's really a career path that works well on both sides and, and it gives you that opportunity to use flexible work as a recruiting tool as well. Yeah, I think that's such a, a great point there too, Dan, about the you know, the ability to, you know, in a sense, like try, try before you buy, right? Like it's just like, almost like test, test driving a car in a sense, right? But, you know, there's been like so many times, like you, you said, uh, traditionally where you know, you're trying to hire through what we would consider those traditional normal avenues and, and you're bringing somebody in and, and yeah, their experience sounds good. And, but it, when you're talking about warehouse work, I think specifically too, like, you, you know, you have some people where, you know, they tell you that, you know, they've driven this forklift, they've operated this forklift, they've worked with, you know, this kind of devices before, whatever you're using for, for picking or whatever the case may be. And, you know, you could, you could ask them, you know, at a certain time, like, you know, well, oh, when, when you worked there, like, you know, what were your productivity numbers like? And then, you know, of course, a lot of people are going to tell you they were amazing, right? They're saying we're the best, right? But then you don't really know until they start working. And then, and I've seen, you know, many times where even in my case, you know, it's interview somebody seemed like, you know, they're a good fit. And, and uh, yeah, like a, a week later, you, you've invested time in, in training them and getting them done. And, and, you know, they stop showing up or, you know, they all of a sudden their attendance like falls off and, you know, it's not good. So, you know, being able to you know, have that ability to use the flexible workforce and, and like you said, you know, be able to, to test them out a little bit, see how are they working and like, okay, you know, it's been a couple of weeks and, you know, they're, they're doing really well and they're productive and they're safe and, and all the important aspects for, for your operation, then, Hey, we can, we can bring them on full time. Yeah. Right. Or, or, you know, we have somebody that, you know, is, is not doing well anymore and, you know, it's time to let them go or, or they're moving on, whatever the case may be. Now we have a spot open and it's like, Oh, well, we have this, this pool of people already that, Hey, we can, we can slide one of these people into that, that spot. So it, I think it really makes a lot of sense there. And, you know, I think also, one thing that's interesting too, I think, is that from the flexible workforce standpoint, there's like a, there's an understanding, I think, on both sides that like, you know, hey, this this is not really like an in, initial long term commitment between the you know flexible worker and the employer. So there's like that understanding there. So it's not like the flexible worker is really coming in and and saying like, hey, like I'm expecting that I'm gonna get hired here. Like they're coming in, they know like. Okay, like the you know the the deal is for you know just one day, four hours, or the deal is for two days, three days, something like that. 
And after that, you know, it's done. Like we, we go our, our separate way. So there's not like kind of a expectation there on either side, I think, which is also, I think is a, a good thing because I've, I've certainly dealt with some situations where, you know, there's been some, some staff that comes in, whether it's from a, a temp agency or, or something like that. And, and, you know, there's like an expectation that they're going to get hired and then, you know, it, it creates kind of like a, a, like almost like an awkward thing in a sense yeah. where you're like, oh, like, you know, the, the assignment's done. Right. And, and that's it. So I think that that flexibility is, you know, really key for the the worker and, and also for the, the workforce. So let, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the, the temp agency aspect versus like the a platform style like Instawork is, because I think that was something that kind of came up in our, our work presentation as well from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. As Kevin uh, is saying just now, we were lucky enough to be on a panel together at the annual work warehouse conference down in Florida. And we were able to speak to a lot of other practitioners as well about what they're doing. We got some great questions from them about how to use flexible work and what the benefits are. And, and one of them was, you know, how does it compare to using temp agencies? And you know, it's really different from a temp agency because we we run an online platform and our job is to connect the workers with the businesses and let them interact together, carry those transactions. We don't work as a temp agency where we're just saying, okay, you, you send us your request and we try to fill it with somebody you maybe never heard of or never saw before, you know, based on our criteria. We, we don't do it that way. It's, it's an online marketplace more like an eBay or an Amazon or something like that. And that's why it's so efficient because we're removing the, the heavier aspects of that so intermediary or middleman. But, you know, we find that a lot of our business partners who have used traditional temp agencies, they get tied into long contracts. They don't always know about the quality of the workers they're going to get or the fill rate. You know, they may have to use three or four different agencies that each give them 40 or 50% of what they want. There, there's just a lot of extra red tape and uncertainty attached to that. What do, do you have experience with that, Kevin, or have you heard of what people are undergoing when they try and use temp agencies in that context? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of experience there. Uh. <laughs> I mean, some, some good experiences and, and definitely some, I could say, contentious experiences too. I, I've certainly been battling with some temp agencies in the, in the past and, you know, definitely, you know, some of them are, are, are still good friends too, that people that have been at those temp agencies that I've worked with. And, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I think the one thing you said in there, which really kind of is the, the underlying thing for, for me as an, as an operator and a warehouse manager was that that visibility into who am I actually getting from this temp agency, which I, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, the temp agency is kind of like constantly try to sell almost in, a, in an aspect, right? Where, you know, they're kind of maybe trying to talk up a candidate a little bit. And, you know, I've had experiences where, you know, you're like, I need someone that can operate a, a deep reach forklift, right? And they send you somebody, person comes in and they're like, oh, no, I, I never have operated a deep reach forklift. And you're like, okay, wait, what am I doing with you today? Right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of that visibility part. I think that's lacking in the traditional temp agency structure for the warehouse manager, whereas, you know, you look at something like, like Instawork, you're able to see kind of that candidate, you're able to see experience, you're able to see ratings on them as well. Like, so you understand like, okay, have they, you know, perform, perform poorly or, or well at other previous assignments, which I think is really important to know too. It's almost- Yeah, you see the, yeah. you see the certifications too, I was going to say, you yeah. know, if, if they, if they have that certification for a forklift or whatever license they might need on a state by state basis, you have that in there as well. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really great. And and for people that maybe are, are watching, listening and you know, are not familiar, it's almost like you see your, your Uber drivers rating, right? And you're seeing like the same kind of thing, like their qualifications and you know, how they performed in, in the past, which I think is such a a great thing and, and so important because, you know, oftentimes when you're utilizing flexible work or, you know, like in the past you would use a TEM from an agency you know, it's really for like a, a short period of time and a specific thing too. Often I would be getting somebody for like, it's like, I need somebody that can specifically do 
this type of forklift because we're doing a project where we need to move all these pallets into new racking or a couple times too, I was doing projects where we're putting in, we were adjusting existing racking. So it was like, we need to quickly empty those racks so that the crew can come in, adjust the, the heights of them and, and put in some different levels and things like that. And then, and then replace those pallets in. So it's like, you want to get somebody in that, Hey, like they have this kind of experience and we can get them up and running quick on a, on a project versus where a lot of times with the agencies, temp agencies I've seen where people come in and then, like I said, they don't quite have the experience that the agency said they have, or they're, you know, they come in and they, they disappear within, you know, an hour or something. I mean, I've, there's been so many times where, you know, I go to the, the, the lead of the department and I'm like, I'm like, oh, how's so-and-so working out? And they're like, well, they went to the bathroom at 10 o'clock and it's now 1130 and I haven't seen them. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, yeah. I think with that in the sense too, like the, like the platform, you know, it gives the, it gives the accountability to the, the worker too, a little bit as well. Cause they know like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be rated right. And in, in a sense, and it's going to be visible to other people. It's going to impact me getting future jobs, whereas the TAMP agency doesn't really have a system like that, typically, from from what I've experienced. And, you know, I think that, like, it's just like, well, they they didn't do okay in this job, but, like, you know, I know we're not going to tell the next company that's, like, you know, looking for somebody, right, because we're just trying to make placements, yep. right? And I, I think also, too, to speak to the TAMP agency, I mean, we're talking a lot about kind of the, the COVID and the impact on the workforce and all those things. And, you know, they have a lot of times, like, a limited pool of workers to, to draw from because they're oftentimes what I've seen is like very, very localized in a, in a sense. And, you know, being able to, to reach out to that pool and tap into them and, you know, and what can be typically a competitive warehouse market, especially where I'm at in, in New Jersey is, is super competitive where there's just tons and tons of warehouses, you know, right next to each other in the same areas. So, you know, it's hard sometimes to, to pull, especially if you're like a smaller, medium sized business versus some of the big guys. And we saw one agency, I remember, told us that during the pandemic, they're like, you know, normally we have, I think it was, I think it was like 1,600 or 1,800 workers that are, you know, out in circulation during the holiday period within that area. And she was like, and I only have like 600 right now, like drastic like, wow. decrease, right? But whereas, yep. you know, I think you look at something like, like Instawork, you know, it's constantly kind of out there and, you know, people can just come in and easily join as a, a worker online and, and figure that out versus where I think temp agencies are, you know, struggle a little bit and, you know, having to constantly try and recruit and, and be out there. And, you know, the visibility is not as, as big as like an online platform would be. Yeah, yeah. for sure. You know, we, we get, you know, thousands of signups in, in, mm. in each metro where we go into it really plenty of workers, as I said, uh, and they're helping to keep those hourly pay rates low just by being so numerous. But it's more a question of competing for shifts. It's more that there aren't enough shifts than there aren't enough yeah. workers. On our part. It, but, you know, you brought up a couple of things that, that resonated with some of the questions that we got down in Florida. One of them was, you know, what do you do when a worker can't act? Despite all the safeguards and all the checks, somebody comes in and, and, and they're just not working out. And, and we usually say, well, you can send them home right away and you can block them on the platform so, so no longer they'll no longer be able to catch shifts at, at that at that business. But, uh, you know, it, another thing that we try and do to make sure that doesn't happen so much is not only background checks and, and, and verifying the experience of the workers, but also advising businesses on how they can set themselves up so that flexible workers are more successful. Right? Are, are there any things that you can suggest about sort of what the workplace should look like, how you should welcome people in, because, you know, you may get a different person on, on each different day. So, so how do you set things up to make sure that they can be successful the moment they set foot in the workplace? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important because a lot of times, too, you, you have situations in, in the warehouse where, you know, it might not be the same person, like, greeting them or, or bringing them in on, on the beginning of the day. So you, you want to make sure you have, like, a, a standardized process in that sense. So whether it's, you know, if I'm the warehouse manager and, you know, I have somebody that's going to start at 9 a.m., but I have a meeting at 9 a.m., you know, I can easily, you know, have one of the leads or a supervisor or another manager, you know, bring them in and, and know what to do. So I think it's important from, uh, 
the operation perspective that you have like a clear communication, you know, ahead of time that you set up with, you know, whoever that person is going to go to, whatever department that your lead or supervisor in that department is, is aware who's coming, you know, what they're supposed to do and then get them set up to, to do that. And also I think it's important too, to, to explain a little bit, whether that person is going to be there for, you know, a couple hours, a full day, two days, three days, whatever the case may be. I mean, I think it's important to give them an explanation of what your business does and who your customer is. So they have that understanding of, hey, like this is who we're, we're serving and, you know, they can kind of, you know, quickly get a sense of like the, the culture and that the expectation. And, and I think too, you know, having somebody come in, I think it's really important to make an environment where, you know, you have people, whether you're bringing them in through a flexible work platform, temp agency, whatever the case, like you never know when you're going to need another full-time employee. So you want to make sure that you're creating an environment where they're going to remember that place that they worked. And oftentimes like we had one place that I was working, we had created like a really, really good culture. And we had a really good relationship with a temp agency that was, I was very convenient. It was like, it was like two buildings down from our building. Actually, it was a great location. And, but we had set up such a culture where, you know, word got out amongst the workers that, and we had like a, a waiting list almost for, for people that wanted to come in. And, and it was just about, you know, giving workers an opportunity and, and, you know, showing them different things. And we had actually, we would provide lunch every Friday for, for people. Um, so things like that, like making the environment well known, and then, you know, having your full-time employees, your, your core workforce be like your own advocates, right? If you make them happy, like they're going to like sing the praises of the place to work. So if somebody comes in, whether they're flexible or potential hire, you know, the employees are going to tell them whether like, Hey, this is a good place yeah. to work. Or they're going to say like, well, you know, you really don't want to work here, you know, something like that. So you want to make sure you're making that good impression. Yeah. And obviously you want to be safe. You want to have a, a clean environment as well. You want to make sure that you have a clear structure indicated to them, like, hey, this is when we take break. This is when you're going to get a lunch. You know, this is what you can do and what you can't do. But you want to set that baseline when they when they come in the door. And then you know, hopefully, you know, at some point, like maybe they'll, they'll grow with you as, as well. But you never know who could be a potential future employee, yeah. whatever source they're coming from. So you want to make a, a good first impression for sure. sure. For sure. When we survey the flexible workers on our platform, after pay, the next most important thing is the team that they're working with. You know, they want an optimistic, motivated, positive team that, that's helpful to each other. And then after that comes the atmosphere. Like you said, a clean, safe place to work that's well lit, you know, well temperature controlled, depending on the job. And, and all those things really make a difference to workers. And they rate the workplaces on our platform too. We talk about the businesses rating the workers. It also works in the other direction. So like you said, word gets around. Well, it certainly does on our platform. The last thing we should talk about today is cost. You know, folks asked about this down in Florida, and it's something that we get asked about a lot. You know, how does the cost of flexible work compare to the cost of a permanent employee? And, you know, sometimes you'll just look at the hourly rate and say, well, a flexible worker seems to have a higher hourly rate, but that doesn't take everything into account. You know, and there's obviously a lot more that goes into the compensation of a permanent worker. What's been your experience sort of with that balance? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good point. And, you know, you do see, I think initially that, I guess you call it the, the face value of the the wage, right? In, in a sense, the hourly wage. But when you look at a full-time employee, I mean, you have all these different things to consider, like, the, you know, the benefits and, you know, covering health insurance and then PTO as, as well, you know, the, the paid time off, like, you know, there's they're not there. You're still paying them. You're, you're getting productivity. Whereas the the flexible worker, you're only really concerned about that that hourly wage, and that's what you're paying. And then the whatever the the percentage is from a form you're you're using or however you're obtaining them. But it, it's a it's a lower overall cost. And I think you know you have that also initial investment too of you know a, for a full time employee where you're going out and you're trying to recruit and then you have time investment and interviews, which, you know, typically is probably multiple interviews before you find the actual candidate. And then there's 
the time crunch too of then having to get them through all their paperwork onboarding all these different things like i, I mean i used to go crazy sometimes with with hr because you know we're trying to bring somebody in and we need somebody like now and they're like oh they can start in three weeks and i'm like three weeks like we missed basically the whole opportunity like where we needed to to, to use somebody like right away right so so you you do have the kind of these all uh, you have to think about like the overall total cost of, of the investment of the full-time employee versus like hey, i need somebody now let me get a flexible worker and you know a lot of that cost up front is is gone and then that cost of the additional benefits and and things of somebody that maybe you only need for a little while a couple months maybe a couple weeks maybe a couple of days you, you know you don't have to worry about all those things and I, I think that it makes makes total sense to be able to do that based on the, the application that you're looking at and, and certainly that that project type of work that higher demand you know a great example from my experience was one company i worked at we used to do a lot of containers from our, our manufacturer overseas and the especially during the pandemic too the port was congested it was very difficult to know and forecast like how many containers are we going to get and then all of a sudden we would get a flood of containers we would need extra labor at the dock and so you know flexible labor would have been a great solution there and then you know and then a couple of days later it would just be like we're, we're just getting like one container That's today like we just got you know like 13 14 15 the other day so we don't need like that help right so it's like you know how do you think about investing not only from a perspective of the cost of an overall full-time employee, but then also that that time as well that goes into it, you know, yep. doing that full-on training and things like that for, you know, maybe somebody that you got to cut like a month later. Or something yeah. Like yeah. No, for sure. You know, it's, it's not just the wages and then the benefits, it's also the overtime pay and it's the recruiting cost before you start. And then you know, if you don't get someone in time, there's that big opportunity cost to revenue you left on the table. Yeah. In our state warehouse labor report, we, we still have a lot of companies that are saying that they had to leave money on the table last year because they just couldn't get enough stuff. So hopefully flexible work will help them to cope with those things uh, going into 23 at second half and, and into 2024 as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you again, Kevin. It's great talking to you again as always. And uh, you know, anybody who wants to check out InstaWork, it's just at instawork.com. We have apps for workers and businesses as well, available on your app stores. And uh, please check out Kevin's new air warehouse podcast. I think you're over a hundred thousand downloads. Is that right now? Oh yeah, we're just actually as we're recording this, we're just cracking maybe a hundred and ten thousand downloads. So wow, we're about to hit episode four hundred too. Actually, so a lot of big cool. milestones going on. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, yeah, definitely check it out. It's a great listen, and he's got all sorts of interesting guests. So thanks a lot, Kevin, and hope to talk to you again soon. Good luck for the second half. All right. Thank you, Dan.